Thank you very much. The floor is back. Well, great to be with you. I feel very much at home at uh, this forum, being a serial entrepreneur, uh, but I do have to admit that I actually took a real job recently, uh, my first. I thought I'd squeeze in a real job before I turned 65. Uh, perhaps the only company, except for maybe Microsoft being here, uh, I should point that out, uh, but I did have close ties with Microsoft during Bill Gates' era. Uh, but I have a certain amount of freedom at Google. Uh, my mission there is to get the Google computers to actually understand natural language. I'll talk more about that. But I thought I'd start out by sharing with you some of my own uh, entrepreneurial and inventing experiences. Uh, I decided I wanted to be an inventor when I was five. Uh, I'm not sure why that is, but my parents gave me all the, these enrichment toys. I knew they were enrichment toys because I had lots of little pieces, and you could put the pieces together in different ways and create different inventions. So I took them all apart and, and created this big inventory of little pieces, and then I would go through the neighborhood and bring back broken bicycles and broken radios and take them apart and add to my inventory. This was an era where you would allow a five-year-old to go through the neighborhood and do that. And I had, I had this idea that if I could just figure out the right way to put these things together, I could create transcendent effects. I didn't have that vocabulary when I was five. I came up with that word a few years ago. But I remember the feeling, if I could just figure out the right way to assemble these things, I could create magical effects. I could solve any problem. And this was kind of a philosophy for my family. The family religion was the power of human ideas. I remember my grandfather coming back from his first return trip to Europe after having fleed uh, Vienna in the summer of 38. Uh, so this was 55, I was seven. And he came back and he described having been given the opportunity to handle with his own hands some original documents by Leonardo da Vinci. And he described it as a religious experience. But these were not documents handed down by God. These were documents created by a human, but they had changed uh, human, the human condition. They had overcome problems. Uh, it was really the power of human ideas uh, that was being communicated. I discovered the computer at 12. I stole an uh, assembly language and Fortran programming manual and taught myself to program. A 12-year-old using a computer is hardly unique today. In fact, I don't know a three-year-old who doesn't have a computer. But uh, in those days, 1960, there were only about 12 computers in all of New York City. I was given the opportunity for, to use the midnight to 8 a.m. shift, which was great. Uh, it was actually like my own personal computer. Uh, ha you had to uh, feed in punch cards. So one of my best friends was this punch card machine. And Anybody here remember punch cards? Oh, wow, okay. Um, when I was 14, I began, I had the idea that we could emulate human thinking in the computer, and I wrote a paper on how I thought the human brain worked and how we could then use those principles uh, to do pattern recognition and AI in, in a computer. Uh, I described the human brain as a series of modules that could recognize patterns. And the patterns were organized in a hierarchy, and we created the hierarchy with our own thinking. And just 50 years later, to the month, I wrote this book, which I'll talk about later, How to Create a Mind, which says the same thing, except now we actually have enough uh, precision in our brain scanning to actually see the brain doing this, and we can, uh, spatial resolution of brain scanning has been growing exponentially, and we can see inside the brain with such precision that we can see interneuronal connections being created in real time and firing in real time, and we can see your brain create your thoughts, and we can see your thoughts create your brain because the interconnection between these modules is created by our own thinking. But we can actually confirm uh, with neuroscience these ideas. Uh, at that time, I was speculating just based on how it appeared that the human brain worked. I uh, wrote a program that, based on these pattern recognition principles, I could find patterns in music uh, and then write original music in the same style. So I would feed in Mozart or Chopin, I would write 
original music that sounded like it was a student of Chopin or, or Mozart. And uh, that's how I got to meet President Johnson. I submitted that to the Westinghouse Science Talent Search and was one of the winners of that. And that was kind of the beginning of my career with artificial intelligence. When I was 17, I started a company at MIT. Uh, there was no such thing as entrepreneurship. Sloan School actually had one little course on entrepreneurship. There were only six of us in the course. No, there was not a concept that anybody recognized. Uh, so I started this uh, project to match up high school students to colleges by computer. Uh, we got this great deal where we could rent uh, a computer from Avco. It had an amazing million bytes of court storage. Uh, and we were able to actually rent it for only $1,000 an hour. Uh, we had a questionnaire with 300 questions and the students would fill it out and we had information on 3,000 colleges uh, and I sold that to a New York publisher. So that was my first business. After graduating MIT, I started a company Kurzweil Computer Products. We developed the first OmniFont OCR, and it was kind of a solution in search of a problem. So we really didn't know what this was good for. We did some market research. We came up with different possible applications. I happened to sit next to a blind guy in an airplane, and he said the really the, said blindness is not a handicap. He travels around the world representing his company. He was actually an entrepreneur, <coughs> but he said the. The primary problem he had was uh, being unable to access ordinary print, and that kind of sparked our first application, which was a reading machine th for the blind. Uh, we needed to invent the flatbed scanner, which didn't exist at that time, and text-to-speech synthesis. We put those together into the first print-to-speech reading machine for the blind. Demonstrated it on January 13, 1976. I remember that because Walter Cronkite, who, who remembers Walter Cronkite? <laughs> uh, you look very young, you couldn't have been around <laughs> when he was an anchor, but um, he had the signature sign off it in his sonorous voice, and that's the way it was, and he would say the date. Well, this was the first time he actually didn't read it himself, he had the reading machine read it, and that's the way it was, January 13th, 1976. I so was invited to go on the Today Show a couple days later. We only had one model, and it didn't always work. Uh, I said, well, can we tape this? Said, no, no, it's a live show. So we got there. It had been working for a couple of days. Uh, and just like two hours before I was to go on live, it stopped working. Uh, so we were taking it apart. And we had the, the parts all over the floor. And Frank Field, who was going to interview me, walked by and said, is there a problem, gentlemen? He says, no, no, we're just making some last minute adjustments. And, uh, and he carefully stepped over all the parts which are on the floor. We put it back together and it still didn't work. So our chief engineer used a time-honored method for fixing delicate electronic equipment, which I'm sure you've used, is he picked it up and in frustration slammed it on the table and then it worked. Uh, so there it went flawlessly. Stevie Wonder actually had Caught that uh, interview, he, he heard that there was going to be something for the blind. He called us up, our receptionist didn't believe it was really him. Uh, and he was, he actually took a, the shuttle from New York to Boston and came in and wanted to buy one. Uh, so we had just finished up another production model at that time and we gave it to him and he went off and that started a relationship, uh, which I'll come back to. Uh, but we, we went on to then uh, perfect the OCR and scanning as a data entry system. That became the basis of Nexus and Lexis, which were the first two really big databases. We went on to do actually natural language understanding uh, and uh, combine that with the OCR. And uh, finally, I sold it to Xerox in 1980. They saw it as a bridge back uh, from because they had all these devices that uh, took information and put it out onto paper because they had printing and copiers. Uh, this was a route to take information on paper and bring it back into the computer, both as images and as recognized characters. 
They then spun it out a few years later as, scan, in a, public, as a public company, Scansoft, which changed its name to Nuance, so that today is, is Nuance. Uh, 1982, I started two companies at the same time, which was uh, kind of unprecedented at that time. One was Curzon Music System, and that gets back to Stevie Wonder. Uh, we'd been getting together when, whenever he was on the East Coast or I was on the West Coast, and we would talk about technology and music and technology and disabilities. And he was lamenting the state of the art in musical instruments and that you had these 19th century acoustic instruments, which were still the instruments of choice, like pianos, guitars, violins, because they created these beautiful, rich, uh, complex sounds. But unless you were a virtuoso, you could only play one or two of those instruments. And even if you could play them all, you couldn't play them simultaneously. And you, most of them were monophonic. Uh, and then there's this world of computer-based instruments where you could play a whole melody and then play it back from a sequencer and play another line over it and build up a multi-track orchestration, except the sounds that you had to use were at that time very thin. You press piano, it would sound like an organ. You press violin, it would sound like an organ. Uh, <laughs> so he said, Wouldn't it, could we combine these two worlds? C could we use these very powerful control methods where you could use any type of controller and you could remember things and you could edit notes out like you edit a letter on a word processor and apply it to these beautiful rich sounds of acoustic instruments. And so I said, well, okay, I think we can do that using pattern recognition and signal processing. And uh, he agreed to actually join our company and we started Curzon Music Systems. And, uh, we then had an instrument at the 1983 NAM show, National Association of Music Merchants, that uh, could do that. And today that's a big division of Hyundai. Uh, it's still a major brand of, of musical instruments. I also started Curzon Applied Intelligence, uh, which developed large vocabulary speech recognition. It was the first commercially marketed large vocabulary speech recognition. We then combined it with natural language understanding to understand the structure of medical reports. And we had products like VoiceRad for radiology, voice uh, path for pathology to allow doctors to actually dictate reports and it had an understanding of within those domains of the meaning of the reports and would understand what it needed to have and could say well you left out the diagnosis or this diagnosis really isn't consistent with these observations uh, that's today a billion dollar business under nuance uh, and that company also became part of of nuance uh, Nuance also acquired Dragon Systems, which was our primary competitor. Those two technologies, both Dragon and Kurzweil, were combined uh, and is the speech recognition from Nuance today, which is used in Siri and, and other products. Um, that was based on hierarchical hidden Markov models, which was a technology we pioneered, which is, I believe, the way the human brain works. And I'll come back to that. Uh, but I believe the brain actually has a hierarchy of these recognizers and each recognizer uses an algorithm that's mathematically equivalent to hidden Markov models, which has become the standard way of doing this type of, of recognition. Uh, then I, uh, let's see, started several other companies, which I won't bore you with. Uh, but around that time, around the time I started these two companies, Kurzweil Applied Intelligence, the speech recognition company, and Kurzweil Music, I began to be interested in timing of technology projects and the technology trends. Because I realized by that time that the key to really being successful is timing. And the inventors whose names you recognize were in the right place with the right idea at the right time. Larry Page and Sergey Brin had a great idea about, hey, we could reverse the direction of the links on the internet and see how many links come into a page and then rank the pages based on that. But they had that idea at exactly the right time. And uh, so I began to wonder, is there something we can reliably anticipate about the timing of technologies? Because your invention has to make sense when you finish the project. And as you roll out the project, the world is changing. And if you don't think it changes quickly, look back three or four years ago, most people didn't use social networks, wikis, 
blogs. It sounds like ancient history. There was only a few years ago. And things were changing quickly in 1981 as well, not as quickly. There's been a continual acceleration. Our first invention, uh, spoken language, took hundreds of thousands of years. We then noticed that uh, stories were drifting from storyteller to storyteller, so we wanted a way of making a permanent record, and we invented written language, and that went a lot faster, only tens of thousands of years. It then took, we wanted a better way of producing written language. The printing press took 400 years to reach a mass audience. The telephone took only 50 years to reach a quarter of the American population. Cell phone did that in seven years. As I mentioned, social networks, wikis, and blogs took about three years to do that. Uh, we now see major changes in technology platforms and standards and uh, business models in one year's time. And my primary advice actually to entrepreneurs, because I do some early stage investing and mentoring, is to really anticipate what the world will be like, and I'll describe a reliable way that you can anticipate certain things about the future, not everything, uh, but there's certain very important features of the future that you can anticipate reliably, and I'll show you how predictable these particular trends are, and then make sure that uh, your plans make sense for that future world. So one of the companies I have now that I'm still involved with, and I founded about five years ago, is an e-reader company. It now has, it's called Media Arc. It now has uh, mu books, music, magazines, movies, uh, television shows. So it has a media stack, and we have deals with uh, Toshiba and uh, HP and other major vendors. Um, we will write down all of the major technology specifications that affect our business. Display resolutions, telecommunication speeds, processing power, mobile computing parameters, and actually describe what they will be like 12 months from now, 24 months from now, 36 months from now. And I'll show you that you can do that reliably. And even though I've been doing this for 30 years, I'm amazed that, wow, mobile computing is going to be that different two years from now? You really need to go through the discipline. I get a lot of business and technology plans that assume the world three years from now will be more or less the same as it is today. And you only, and you only need to look backwards to see that that's not the case and the pace of change is going to accelerate. And the, there's one thing that's driving this acceleration. And this was a discovery I made 30 years ago because I asked this question, what can we reliably anticipate about the future? My assumption was probably not much, except the common wisdom that you cannot predict the future. And I'm, but uh, being an engineer, I thought I would gather a lot of data, and maybe if I used the right visualization tools and squinted at it, maybe I could make some rely, uh, educated guesses as to where technology would, will be. And I made a surprising <coughs> discovery. If you plot the fundamental measures of information technology, not any type of technology, but fundamental measures of information technology, for example, the price performance of computing, calculations per second per constant dollar, or the number of bits we move around wirelessly, uh, or the number of bits we move around on the internet, or the cost of sequencing a base pair of DNA, or the amount of DNA we're sequencing, or the spatial resolution of brain scanning, or the amount of data we're collecting on the brain each year. These fundamental measures follow very predictable trajectories. And that trajectory is exponential and not linear. And our few comments on that are in order. Our intuition about the future is not exponential, it's linear. If you ever wonder, why do I have a brain? It's, it's in, in fact, to, in order to predict the future, so we can anticipate the consequences of our actions or inaction. So I'd be walking through the fields 10,000 years ago, and I'd go, okay, that animal's going that way. I'm coming up this way. We're going to meet at that rock. I'm going to go a different way. Turned out this ability to predict the future was useful for survival, and that became hardwired in our brains. But those, that anticipation of the future, that intuition about what will happen, is linear. We assume that animal would go at the same pace. It's not going to speed up exponentially. That was a good assumption. The kinds of challenges we had thousands of years ago were met by linear extrapolation of current trends. And that is our intuition. And the primary difference between myself and my critics is that they're using their linear int uh, intuition about the future. And this can be very sophisticated people. 
had, had a debate with a uh, Nobel Prize winning biologist right halfway through the genome project and saying, well, I told you this project wasn't going to work. Here we are seven and a half years into a 15 year project and only 1% has been finished. It's 1%, seven and a half years, it's going to take 750 years, just like we said. That was linear thinking. My reaction was, oh, we're at 1%, we're almost done. Because 1% on an exponential trajectory and had been doubling every year, had been doubling prior to the 1990, and then 1990 we collected one ten thousandth of the genome, and then two ten thousandths in 1991. It looked like nothing was happening, but it was growing exponentially. Once you get to 1%, that's only seven doublings from 100%. And indeed, it was finished seven years later, and every other aspect of biology has continu continued to scale up in that e exponential manner. And it's remarkable how predictable this exponential trajectory is with regard to every fundamental parameter of every information technology. And two other points about that. Uh, this, what's the difference between a linear and an exponential projection? Well, a linear projection, that's our intuition, goes one, two, three, four. An exponential one goes two, four, eight, sixteen. It doesn't sound radically different, except by the time you get to 30, the linear projection is at 30, the exponential projection is at a billion. And this is not an idle speculation about the future. Uh, this is several billion times more powerful per constant dollar than the computer I used when I was a student at MIT. I went to MIT because it was so advanced that it actually had a computer. It took up half a building. You need a special permission to get in. It took up, uh, well, it was like two whole floors. Uh, this is thousands of times more powerful. It's mil about a million times less expensive. That's a several billion fold increase in price performance. It's a hundred thousand times smaller. That's another reliable exponential projection. Uh, we're shrinking technology at a rate of about 103 d volume per decade. We'll do that again in the next 25 years. This will again be at least a billion times more powerful uh, per constant dollar. It'll be 100,000 times smaller. It'll be the size of a blood cell. It gives you some idea of what will be feasible. And the other key point is that it's not just these gadgets we carry around that are affected. It affects everything. Ultimately, will affect everything we care about. Now, not every technology is an information technology at every point in time. Health and medicine was not an information technology up until very recently. The enabling factor to make it an information technology has been the Genome Project. But even that uh, project, completed in 2003, needed uh, some additional maturity so that we could begin to understand how these little software programs work. But up until recently, health and medicine was hit or miss. We would just find things that happened to work. Oh, here's something lowers the blood pressure. We don't really know why it works. Uh, we automated the process to some extent, so we'd go through a list of 20,000 compounds to find something that had a, a desired effect, like lowering blood pressure or killing HIV, but we didn't really know why they worked, and we couldn't really design them. Kind of an era of tool making where we just find tools. Oh, okay, this rock could make a good hammer. We couldn't actually use tools to create tools. Uh, that's now completely changed. Biology is fundamentally an information process. We have little software programs inside us called genes. Uh, these, these little software programs evolved tens of thousands of years ago when conditions are very different. So for example, the fat insulin receptor gene says hold on to every calorie because the next hunting season may not work out so well. Uh, that was a very good idea 10,000 years ago. You worked all day to get a few calories and there were no refrigerators, so you stored them in the fat cells of your body. That now underlies an epidemic of obesity I would like to tell my fat insulin receptor gene you don't need to do that anymore. <laughs> I'm, I'm confident the next hunting season will be good uh, <laughs> uh, at, at the supermarket. <laughs> and uh, so this was done at the Johnson Diabetes Center. We have technologies now that can turn genes off, like RNA interference. They turned off this gene, and these animals ate ravenously, uh, remained slim. They didn't get diabetes. They didn't get heart disease. They lived 20% longer. They got the health benefits of caloric restriction while doing the opposite. We have te technologies that can add genes. So I'm involved with a company where we take cells out of the throat uh, of patients with a disease called pulmonary hypertension. Now, most diseases involve a whole network of genes. It's not one gene, one disease in most cases. But this disease is one gene. If you're missing this gene, you probably will get this terminal disease. 
life expectancy two years on diagnosis. We scrape the cells out of the throat, uh, add the gene in vitro so it doesn't trigger the immune system, which was one of the problems with earlier forms of gene therapy, spec that it got done correctly, replicate the cell several million fold, another new technology. Now we have millions of cells with that patient's DNA, but with the gene they're missing, inject it back in the body, goes through the bloodstream, the body recognizes them as lung cells, and this has actually cured this fatal disease. Uh, there's many other e examples of this. Uh, stem cells now, we can rejuvenate or actually grow uh, any organ in the body. And if, if you're wondering why you're not hearing much about this uh, old controversy about stem cell uh, research, it's because we've programmed our way around it. We can now take a skin cell, add four genes, change it into the equivalent of an embryonic stem cell called an IPC, induced pluripotent cell, and then you can specialize that to be any type of cell in the body. The ethicists who are opposed to embryonic stem cell research support this because even though it's the equivalent of an embryonic stem cell, there's no embryo involved. And anyway, if you want a new liver, you'd like to have your DNA, not the DNA of some other embryo. So just in the news a couple of weeks ago, uh, this girl had a damaged windpipe and she, she couldn't speak, it was affecting her breathing, it was actually threatening to her health. So using computer modeling, they modeled her, her windpipe on a computer using a 3D printer, which I'll get to in a moment. Uh, they printed out with biodegradable materials, uh, the biodegradable scaffolding of her windpipe, populated it with Stem, with her stem cells, grew her windpipe in a, 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 a petri dish uh, and installed it surgically and she now has uh, a windpipe with her own DNA. Uh, this has been done for years with tracheas. It's been done with more complex organs like kidneys and animals. Um, my father had a heart attack in 1961 and he could hardly walk um, and he then died of this. 50% of all heart attack survivors have a damaged heart called low ejection fraction. You can now fix that with a stem cell therapy with a beating heart. And I've talked to people who could hardly walk and are now rejuvenated. You have to be a medical tourist because the FDA hasn't approved this yet, but uh, that will happen uh, within a few years. Uh, I could go on for a long time about these examples, but the point is that we've now taken health and medicine based on biology from being a hit or miss affair and therefore linear, still useful, but uh, not exponential, to where it is now an information technology, basically reprogramming biology as the information process that it truly is. And therefore it's subject to this law of accelerating returns, which is a doubling in power every year. These technologies are already a thousand times more powerful than they were when the general project was completed in 2003. They'll be a thousand times more powerful in 10 years, a million times more powerful than today in 20 years and it will be a very different era. So let me just show you quickly, uh, so we have time for questions, just how predictable this is. This is that first graph that I had in 1981. I had it through 1980, this goes through 2009. This is the price performance of computing. Calculations per second for constant thousand dollars. Goes back to the 1890 census. So first of all, this is a logarithmic scale. So every, we're not adding to something, we're actually adding zeros or orders of magnitude. So I every la labeled level there is 100,000 times greater than the level below it. So this little curve represents trillions fold increase in the amount of computation you can get for the same cost uh, since the 1890 uh, census. Several billion fold just since I was a student people look at this and they go, oh, Moore's Law. But Moore's Law had actually only been underway for six or seven years when I uh, did, did this first version of this graph. Um, and Moore's Law has to do with shrinking the size of transistors on an integrated circuit. That was not the first paradigm to bring exponential growth to computing. It was the fifth. Uh, in the 1950s, they were shrinking vacuum tubes, making them smaller and smaller to keep that exponential growth going. C CBS predicted the election of Eisenhower using a vacuum tube based computer the first time the networks did that, 1952. Remember that? <laughs> <laughs> I was four, so I don't remember it. But they finally couldn't shrink the vacuum tubes anymore and keep the vacuum. I have a little museum and we have 
competed with tiny little vacuum tubes, and that was about the end of the line for vacuum tubes. But that was not the end of the line for this ongoing law of accelerating returns uh, having to do with price performance of computing. It just went to the fourth paradigm, transistors, and then the fifth paradigm. And people say, oh, Moore's law is coming to an end, as if that means that's the end of the law of accelerating returns, and that Moore's law is basically this exponential growth, and it's the only paradigm that does that. Moore's law is one paradigm of many just within computation, and computation is one example among many of different forms of information technology that have this exponential growth. If you talk to Justin Ratner, the CTO of Intel, he'll tell you they have the sixth paradigm, which is self-organizing three-dimensional molecular circuits working in their labs. They expect the crossover to be in the teen years, well before we run out of speed uh, with flat integrated circuits, which is the fifth paradigm. But the, most, but the most important thing about this is look at how smooth and predictable a curve that is. I had it through 1980 and 81 and projected it out to 2050, and it's exactly where it should be now in 2013. I mean, where's World War I or World War II or the Great Depression or the Cold War? People say, well, it must have slowed down during the recent recession, although they don't say that here in Silicon Valley because clearly that has not been the case. It's a very inexorable, predictable trajectory. And and people say, well, why are we working so hard? If it just does it on its own, why don't we all just sit back and relax and let it happen? Uh, and then it wouldn't happen. So I think what, is, what we can rely on, and what we can predict, is the passion of people such as all of you to be innovative and create the next innovations. And we create these innovations in an exponential, multiplicative fashion. We use, you know, we're using the computers today of 2013 to create the computers of 2014 and 2015, and we try to make them twice as powerful. You know, we don't try to go from a billion calculations per second to a, a billion and a hundred. We try to make it two billion, and that is a remarkably predictable trajectory. And a straight line is exponential growth. That's actually a slow exponential. Uh, there's been slow exponential rise in the rate of exponential growth. It took three years to double the price perform of computing in 1900, two years in 1950, 12 months in the year 2000, it's now down to 11 months. But even just one level of exponential growth, 30 doublings is multiplying by a billion. And you could buy one transistor for a dollar in 1968, you can buy 10 billion today. They're better because they're smaller, therefore they're faster. The cost of a transistor cycle has been coming down by about half every year. That's a 50% deflation rate, and that's true of every form of information technology. So the fact that you can buy an Android phone or an iPhone that's twice as good as the one two years ago for half the price uh, is because of this 50% deflation rate. And we put some of that improved price performance in price, so prices come down. We put some of it into performance, so performance goes up. Uh, but it's a 50% deflation rate. So if you want to calculate a million instructions per second or communicate a million bits wirelessly or sequence a million base pairs of DNA, it'll cost you half as much as it did a year ago. And, the econo and more and more of the economy is becoming information technology. It will really dominate uh, the co economy by the 2020s. And the economists worry about deflation. We had massive deflation during the Depression, the Great Depression. Uh, that was a different cause. It was a collapse of consumer confidence. But nonetheless, if you can get the same stuff and I'll get to three-dimensional printing in a moment, so I do mean stuff, for half the cost uh, of a year ago, you'll buy more. I mean, that's economics 101. But are you really going to double your consumption and do that year after year to keep up with this 50% deflation rate? Because uh, after all, how much do you need? Aren't you going to reach a saturation of, of your need or capacity to consume these information technologies? And if you only increase it, say, 50%, then the size of the economy, not as measured in bits, bytes, and pace pairs, but as measured in constant currency, will shrink. And for a variety of good reasons, that would not be a good thing. But that's not what happens. We actually more than double our consumption. I have 50 consumption curves like this. This is bits of memory shipped. We actually increase ev our consumption of every form of information technology 18% per year in constant currency and that's been true of every form of information technology every year for the last 50 years, despite the fact that you can get twice as much of it each year for the same cost. And the reason for that is all of you. It's innovation. 
because as price performance reaches certain points, whole new applications explode. I mean, why didn't we have uh, social networks six or seven years ago? Because Mark Zuckerberg was still in junior high school? No, because uh, there were social networks, attempts to do them, and there were arguments, you know, can we afford to allow our users to download a picture? I mean, the price performance wasn't there. In the book I wrote in the 1980s, I anticipated, first of all, the web, because I saw the ARPANET uh, growing exponentially, but it was only connecting a few thousand scientists. It's the predecessor to the internet and to the web. I did the simple math and said, wow, this is going to be a World Wide Web connecting hundreds of millions of people to each other and to vast knowledge resources by the late 90s. Uh, people thought that was ridiculous when the entire American defense budget could only tie together a few thousand scientists. But that's what happened. That's the power of exponential growth. And I saw that the information on the then nascent web uh, was growing exponentially. We wouldn't be able to find anything. But the, the computational and communication resources needed to do search engines would come into place in the late 90s. And so y you could see that coming as well. Uh, you would not have been able to predict that of the you know, 40 different companies and little projects that were trying to you know, create search engines, that it would be these couple of kids at Stanford with their late night dorm room challenge uh, that would end up dominating the world of search. And this was just kind of a little bit of bravado in a dorm room that, hey, I could use a notebook computer and actually reverse every link on the web, and then we could use this paradigm that we use in science of knowing how important the science article is by how many other articles refer to it. We could uh, rank the importance of web pages by how many other pages link to it. And there was doubt that that could be done on uh, you know, their notebook computers, but they did it and then created a useful search engine. It spread down the hall uh, on that Stanford dorm and then to the entire dorm and then to all of Stanford and then to other colleges. And I think you know the rest of the story. Uh, that would have been hard to predict, but the fact that search engines were coming would be needed and that the computational resources to support it were coming into place, you could predict from these types of curves. Time magazine uh, had a cover story on this. They wanted to put the computer they had covered in their magazine as the last point. It's right on the curve, and this is a curve I laid out 30 years ago, so it, it's remarkably predictive in power. Uh, the graph on the right is the number of bits that we move around the world or that we transmit wirelessly. A century ago, there was Morse code over AM radio, now it's 4G networks. Uh, that's trillions fold increase because that's a logarithmic scale. Again, look at how predictable a trajectory that is. Uh, the internet data traffic in bits, uh, this is uh, roughly doubling every year. <coughs> uh, there's that graph on the left that I had just the first few points of in the early 80s and projected this World Wide Web. The, d the graph on the right is the same data, only seen on a linear scale. And that's actually how we experience the world. We don't experience it logarithmically. So to the casual observer, it looked like, whoa, World Wide Web, a brand new thing. Came out of nowhere, but you could see it coming. And I mentioned biology. We, we could talk a lot more about it. Uh, but this is, this is now in the early stages of transforming all of health and medicine. And we, <coughs> there's some very exciting projects where we will program our way uh, to uh, uh, counteract uh, cancer, heart disease, uh, Alzheimer's, really uh, all diseases. Uh, there's some very exciting methodologies that are being pursued. Uh, if I want to send you a book or a, or a movie or a music album a few years ago, I'd send you a FedEx package. Today I can send you an email attachment with those products. <coughs> I could also send you this violin or this guitar. Uh, these were actually printed out on a three-dimensional printer. You can go in a kiosk in Japan, be scanned by a laser, and then print out a little replica of yourself. Uh, you can print out elaborate mechanisms like that. This is now the quiet before the storm. We can predict, I am predicting, a major revolution in 3D printing that will unfold gradually as the precision keeps coming down. Right now, the, the scale of precision is in uh, multiple microns. It needs to be submicron to really begin to take over uh, major portions of electronics. The range of materials is expanding. This little metal ring was printed out on a three-dimensional printer. That's a simple example. You can print out elaborate mechanisms. We soon will be able to print out electronics. You can print out glass, ceramic, plastic, metal, 
uh, biodegradable scaffolding, so you can actually print out human organs, so you can print out both the biodegradable material for the scaffolding and the stem cells using a 3D printer. Uh, I've been saying that in the early 20s we'll be able to print out clothing, but there's actually a project I just read about yesterday where they're beginning to experiment with being able to print out clothing using a 3D printer. And people say, oh, that's going to be the end of the fashion industry. But, and, and indeed, there will be millions of free designs that you can download and then print out at pennies per pound, because that's what it costs you as a 3D printer. Uh, but that's not going to lead to the destruction of the fashion industry any more than turning music and movies and books into elect, uh, digital products has destroyed those industries. And yes, there are millions of free songs, books, movies that you can download for free, and you can have a very good time with all of these free media products, and yet people still spend money to get Harry Potter, the latest blockbuster, music from their favorite artists, and you have a coexistence of an open source market with very high quality products and a proprietary market, and you also have a coexistence then of an illegal downloading of the proprietary products, which isn't always a bad thing. I mean, Microsoft here uh, started out with this famous letter by Bill Gates to Byte Magazine, the first computer magazine, you know, complaining about this illegal copying of these uh, Microsoft uh, basic paper tapes and that this was just like stealing something from your grocery store. But it did establish Microsoft Basic as the standard and then enabled Microsoft to then sell follow-on products. And uh, you know, a lot of people have said that Microsoft wouldn't exist had it not been for that illegal downloading. But, so it's complicated, but uh, software hasn't been destroyed. I mean, Microsoft and Google are both quarter trillion dollar companies. Uh, the music industry has not been destroyed. If you look at the revenues, they've actually gone up because of the greater ease with which you can distribute and promote these products uh, using online business models. Business models have certainly been destroyed and they're still in flux, but the overall revenues of publishing, music, uh, movies has actually grown despite the, the fact that you can get all these free products That'll be the future of the economy, a coexistence of open source and proprietary forms of information. So you'll be able to you know, have download cool clothing, but people will still spend money for the latest hot designs from their favorite designer. And I mentioned I've been thinking about thinking for 50 years and our ability now to see inside the brain. These are different forms of brain scanning, including non-invasive Brain scanning in a living brain is growing exponentially. We can now see uh, in the living brain, your brain creates your thoughts and your thoughts create your brain. And since I only have a few minutes, I'll kind of jump to the punchline. But if you look at that picture uh, on the top, uh, that wrinkled surface is the neocortex. And neocortex means new rind. And it's a covering around the brain. And it first emerged 200 million years ago in the first mammals, which were rodent-like creatures. And in those first mammals, and in rodents today, uh, the neocortex is about the size of a postage stamp, and it's about the thickness of a postage stamp. And it's just a thin covering around the brain, but it's capable of doing a different ki type of thinking uh, than animals could do without a neocortex. Even the, this neocortex is one pattern recognizer thick. It's a whole series of these pattern recognizers that can either recognize a pattern or that have a pattern that controls behavior and even uh, motor uh, reflexes. And these pattern recognizers are organized in a hierarchy. And the connections are not uh, in the third dimension because, as I say, it's flat and it's one pattern recognizer thick. But this, uh, p there's connections between the different pattern recognizers that form a conceptual hierarchy. And these pattern recognizers are flexible. They can recognize a pattern even if it's part of the pattern is not there or distorted or occluded. Uh, behaviors are organized in the same hierarchy. And if suddenly one behavior doesn't work, it can kind of try out an alternative and it can on the fly experiment uh, with different innovations. And so if one rodent discovers some new way of solving a problem, uh, it could then learn from that and actually then learn that new behavior and other members of the species can observe that new innovation and that uh, new innovation and behavior can uh, spread virally through the community. Animals without a neocortex can't do any of those things. They have 
fixed behaviors that are pre-programmed that they cannot adjust. Now they can learn new behaviors but not in the course of one lifetime. In the course of maybe a thousand lifetimes, using biological evolution, a new fixed behavior can evolve. That was perfectly fine 200 million years ago. The environment changed very slowly. It would take thousands of years for there to be significant environmental changes and over those thousands of years, uh, these non-mammalian animals without a neocortex could evolve a new behavior to cope with it. And it kept, it worked fine for another 100 million years. But then something happened 65 million years ago. We call it today the Cretaceous Extinction Event. And if you dig down to a layer of rock sediment reflecting 65 million years ago, the geologists will tell you it reflects a sudden, turbulent, violent change in the environment that happens suddenly. We think it has to do with the media. And we see this geological evidence all around the globe. And animals without a neocortex could not adjust their behaviors quickly enough. That's why it's called an extinction event. That's when the dinosaurs uh, went extinct. Uh, tens of thousands of species went extinct. That's when mammals took over their ecological niche because they could cope with it and learn new behaviors uh, to adjust to this very sudden change in the environment. And then to anthropomorphize, biological evolution said, hmm, this neocortex is pretty good stuff, and it began to grow it. And mammals evolved, they got bigger, their brains got bigger, but the neocortex got bigger even faster, and that's why it developed these convolutions and fissures, basically to create more s surface area. If you took the human neocortex and stretched it out, it's still a thin uh, organ, it's about the size of a table napkin, it's still very thin, it's about the th thickness of a table napkin, but it has all these convolutions and ridges, so now it's actually 80% of the brain, and it's where we do our thinking. And the major innovation in Homo sapiens is that we have this frontal cortex, we have this uh, forehead. If you look at other, mammal, uh, other primates, they have a slanted brow, they don't have this frontal cortex. And it's not qualitatively different. It's an additional quantity of neocortex. But now we have enough quantity to add more levels of abstraction so that we could think abstract thoughts. And you know, some of these modules recognize very primitive things like the edge of an object or the crossbar in a capital A that takes place in a region called V1. Uh, other pattern recognition modules recognize things like humor or irony. And you might think that those are more complex uh, or, or have additional features than the very simple one, uh, ones that are recognizing simple features, but they're actually the same. This was noticed 50 years ago by a neuroscientist when I wrote that first paper about how the brain worked. Uh, and he noticed that the neocortex was the same structurally everywhere, had the same neurons, the same interconnection patterns. He said neocortex is neocortex. Uh, we didn't then know how it worked, uh, but he did make that observation. And this additional quantity of neocortex we got with the frontal cortex was the ena primary enabling factor that permitted Homo sapiens to develop language and art and science and technology and innovation and innovation conferences. Uh, no other species does that. Yes, chimpanzees can use language with sign language and so on, but if you look at the sentences they form, they're all uh, very simple subject, predicate, object structures. They don't have this indefinite, complex hierarchical structure that human language has. They can create tools, but they're simple tools, and they can't use the tools to create another generation of tools, so they don't have an evolutionary process of tool making and of innovation. Uh, it was that additional neocortex that enabled us to do that. <coughs> and I'll just describe quickly how that works. So I have, there's a lot of redundancy, so I've got hundreds of these little modules, and this is, is kind of a symbol of what one of those modules looks like. And I've got hundreds that recognize a crossbar to a capital A, and that's all they care about. A beautiful song could play, a pretty girl could walk by, they don't care. But if they see a crossbar to a capital A, they get very excited, and they say crossbar, and a high probability comes out of the output axon. These modules, by the way, are not neurons. They're a module of about 100 neurons. One of the pieces of research that came out just recently is that there are these modules of 100 neurons that are repeated throughout the neocortex, and there's no plasticity, no rewiring within those modules, but there's complete rewiring between the modules. So that goes up to a higher level 
a higher conceptual level, and there could be a module there that says, ah, oh, capital A, because it's getting other topological features that indicate that letter. That thing goes to a higher level, and the higher level module could say, ah, oh, we're at Apple, or Microsoft, or Google. And uh, if that recognizes, says, a P C is APPL, but doesn't C and E, it sends information down to all the E recognizers saying, I think there's you know, a good chance there's going to be an E coming along, so be on the outlook for it. Those E recognizers will change their recognition threshold, so if they see something that's kind of smudged, could be an E, ordinarily they wouldn't think it's an E. It says, ah, good enough, and it says, yeah, we see an E. Uh, information goes up and down uh, the, the hierarchy in this way. We're always anticipating what we're going to hear next. Uh, in fact, very often we perceive what we think, expect to perceive, because we're constantly predicting at every level of the hierarchy what, what it, we're going to see. Go up another five levels, and now you're at a pretty high level of the hierarchy, and below that hierarchy, the recognizers go into the different senses, and so it may get information that there's a certain fabric, a certain perfume, a certain voice quality, and we'll say, uh, aha, my wife entered the room. Go up another 10 levels, and now you're at a, at a very abstract level that tends to be in the frontal cortex, uh, and there could be a recognizer that goes, oh, that, uh, that was funny, that was ironic, she's pretty. I talk about in the book uh, this brain surgery uh, on this young girl who is conscious. You can be conscious during brain surgery because there's no pain receptors in the brain. And whenever the surgeons stimulated a particular point in her neocortex, she would start to laugh. And they thought they were triggering some kind of laugh reflex, but they quickly discovered that, no, they were actually triggering the perception of humor. She, she found everything hilarious whenever they triggered the spot. Uh, you guys are so funny just standing there was a typical comment. Uh, and they weren't funny, so uh, they had found a spot that recognized humor. She obviously has more than one. Now, what happens, an interesting piece of research is, what happens to the region V1, which is a region that's associated with very low-level primitive features of visual images, like crossbars to capital A, what happens to it in a congenitally blind person? Does it just sit there saying, well, maybe someday we're going to get visual images, we better be ready? No, it actually gets harnessed by the frontal cortex to help it with high-level uh, concepts like humor and irony, uh, which are at the opposite end of the spectrum, or the continuum, in terms of complexity of feature from what it normally does, uh, showing the interchangeability uh, of this basic algorithm in the neocortex. Uh, the fact that irony is more complex than the crossbar to capital A has to do with the hierarchy, the complexity of the hierarchy below it. T two other comments. Where does the hierarchy come from? We create that with our own thinking, and we can only lay down one conceptual level at a time. So we create our own ideas and personality and memories uh, in this way. Uh, so you are what you eat, but it's even more importantly, you are what you think. So be careful who you hang out with. Uh, I recommend hanging out with Silicon Valley entrepreneurs. Um, and the other point is, is 300 million a lot or a little? Well, it was enough. It was an enabling factor, as I mentioned, for us to evolve art and science and language and so on. Uh, so it was a lot from the perspective of other species. But if you've ever been frustrated, you can't learn a language in one day and how long it takes to actually learn new material, uh, we'd like more. Now, these devices we carry around our brain extenders. I felt that part of my brain had gone on strike during that one-day SOPA strike. Uh, it is an extension of our brains into the cloud. If I need 10,000 computers for two seconds, you can access a Microsoft or Google or Apple cloud and, and uh, access that. Uh, but it does have, it is, is modulated by this physical device. Uh, we do have people that have computers in their brains today, like Parkinson's patients. They are growing exponentially. They can now be actually connected to hundreds of points in the brain. You can download new software to the computer inside the patient, connected into their brain from outside the patient. Uh, they're small, they're pea-sized, so they, they can use minimally invasive surgery, but it does require surgery. I mentioned we're shrinking technology at an exponential rate. These will be the size of blood cells by the 2030s. We'll, be able to, we'll have millions of nanobots in our bloodstream augmenting our immune system. That's a whole other story, but also going inside our brain, basically just putting our brain 
on the cloud, and the cloud is pure information technology. It's doubling in power every year. So someone's approaching me and I want to say something clever and I need more than 300 million pattern recognizers. I need maybe a billion or 10 billion for three seconds, just like I can access now 10,000 computers or a million computers for a few seconds in the cloud. I'll be able to access more neocortex. Uh, we'll be able to expand our neocortex into the cloud. Uh, that'll have certain benefits. We can back it up. It'll be faster because synthetic neocortex is a million times faster than the biological one. But the main point is we will expand our neocortex into the cloud in the 2030s. And remember what happened the last time we expanded our neocortex? That was the enabling factor for us to develop language, art, and science. Uh, and so we will make another qualitative leap based on this quantitative expansion of our thinking. And if you were to ask pre-language humanoids, gee, this is exciting, you've got this frontal cortex now, what's it going to be like when you in invent language and art and science and technology? They probably wouldn't understand the question. Uh, today, at least, we can understand the question. We can answer it by analogy, but we will make a qualitative leap uh, based on this additional thinking power. We're already actually a lot smarter than we used to be. I've been managing work groups in entrepreneurial settings for 45 years, and what used to take hundreds of people years can now be done by a few people in days. We have a great democratization of the tools of entrepreneurship and innovation. Uh, it used to require a big company or government lab or university lab to, to make major leaps. Uh, today, a, you know, a couple of kids with the notebook computers created Google. Uh, a uh, kid with his notebook computer created Facebook. Uh, there was just a 14-year-old that created a new early uh, test for pancreatic cancer. I mean, the tools of radical change are in everybody's hands. A kid in Africa with a smartphone has access to more information than the President of the United States did 15 years ago. And the opportunities are going to continue to grow at an exponential rate. They're going to accelerate the pace of change of destroying old in industries is happening faster and faster. Uh, companies need to actually recognize what they've created. Kodak was, uh, was a $30 billion market cap company. It went bankrupt recently. And it was put out of business by the digital camera. And guess who invented the digital camera? It was Kodak. Uh, so they really didn't recognize what business they were in. They thought they were in the chemical development business. They were actually in the imaging business. And imaging is you know, much more exciting today than it's ever been. Uh, so it's a great time to be an entrepreneur. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mike. This was yeah. terrific. Thanks. Do you have time for a few questions? I, yeah, I'm not yeah, going anywhere. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, there's a question over there. Let me see if I can get a microphone for you. Do we have microphones? Yes. Natalie's. Do you have a microphone, Natalie? Or please ask your question. I'll, I'll repeat the question. I my voice carries. All right, Dave Snyder. Uh, you, you described the exponential growth, and, and uh, I appreciate that. Uh, but do, does it come, come with that exponential increase in complexity and an exponential increase in opportunities or errors creep in? And so if you could comment on uh, the challenges for safety and for coping skills, We're, we, we sometimes are overwhelmed by the technology we deal with and you go out of the door in the morning and it's very complicated what you have to deal with. Well, on <coughs> sure. Uh, computers are actually getting simpler to use. They're becoming more uh, what we consider uh, humans to be. Uh, we don't have to become engineers to use them. Uh, when I started using computers in the 1960s, you had to be an engineer to use a computer and today you know, everybody uses them and we can talk to them in natural language. Uh, in terms of reliability, I mean, companies like Microsoft and Google each spend billions of dollars on security and reliability. Uh, the cloud is actually the best place to put your information. Uh, computers are increasingly relating to us in human terms, uh, like natural language. Uh, Watson uh, is a very good e example of that from IBM. Uh, the it's a, this is a natural language game, Jeopardy. It got this query correct. A long, tiresome speech delivered by a frothy pie topping. And I should add that was in the rhyme category. And it very quickly said, what is a meringue harangue? Uh, and Watts, uh, 
Jennings and the other guy, uh, the best two players, uh, didn't get that. And as you can see, Watson got a higher score than the best two human players put together. What's not often appreciated is that Watson got its knowledge not by being programmed fact by fact, uh, the way a project named Psych uh, was designed. It actually got its knowledge by reading Wikipedia and several other encyclopedias, 200 million pages of natural language documents. And that's actually what I'm doing at Google, is creating algorithms, uh, biologically inspired, kind of a synthetic neocortex, to go and read and understand for semantic meaning the billions of pages on the web and the billions of pages in books, uh, and, and basically to enhance search and question answering, not just to do it by keywords, and both Microsoft and Google do a very good job at that, uh, but to do it uh, based on semantic meaning. Uh, and people sometimes say, well, you know, Kurzweil's right, hardware is growing exponentially, but software is stuck in the mud. Uh, aside from these visceral examples, also Google self-driving cars, uh, there was actually a systematic study of the, both the uh, productivity of software and hardware done by the Scientific Advisory Board to President Obama and found actually more advances uh, in software than in hardware. For example, linear programming, which I believe is used in the brain and is an important technique in AI and computer science, had improvements of 1,000 to 1 over the last 12 years uh, in hardware, but 15,000 to 1 in software for a total product of 15 million to 1 because they multiply each other, but more progress from software than from hardware. Yeah, okay. In arenas where our brains are competing with computers, in something like security where a password is being put up against a brute force machine, how do you think we're going to uh, compete <laughs> in the future? As well, we I, don't, I don't think it's a competition. <coughs> I mean, we create these tools to extend our reach. So I couldn't reach that fruit at the higher brand. So a thousand years ago, I invented a tool to allow me to extend my physical reach. And certainly these devices now extend our mental reach and we have access to vast amounts of information and knowledge and, and problem solving with our tools, but we create them to basically make ourselves smarter. It's not an alien invasion of these intelligent machines to compete with us from Mars. Um, I mean, that's my view of it. And, you know, the idea of AI running amok and kind of being a species apart and destroying us is the theme of many science futurism movies. Uh, but if we look at how it's actually going, we see it very well integrated. Uh, we see over a billion smartphones, seven billion cell phones. Uh, there's billions of computerized devices around the world. Uh, and, you know, these technologies, people say, oh, only the wealthy and the elite are going to have these. And I say, yeah, like cell phones, uh, where you had to be, in fact, wealthy and elite to get a mobile phone. But only the wealthy get these technologies at a point when they don't work. Uh, uh, by the time they work well and do a million things, according to the Apple, Microsoft, and Google ads, uh, they're, you know, they're almost free. Uh, you've got 30% penetration of cell phones in Africa, and so I could go on in that, in that vein. But uh, they're basically enhancements of the human condition, is my view. But if, if the problem is linear versus exponential, how come all the futurists other than you consistently overestimate the speed of progress? And how come entrepreneurs consistently overestimate their revenue growth? <laughs> <laughs> how well, come we always think it's going to go faster than it does? Uh, we only uh, overestimate our progress in the short term. We generally radically underestimate our progress in information technology in the long term, we leave out some complexity, so things may take a little bit longer in the short term, but then people leave out this basic exponential progression, and so long-term growth is, uh, vastly exceeds uh, the actual phenomena uh, w within information technology. But more and more areas are, are subject to information technology. Uh, but if you look at the, the progress of uh, the kind of technologies that Microsoft, Google, Apple, and other, and lots of little companies are, are doing, the pace is really breathtaking, and uh, we have major innovations now in one year time that can transform a whole industry. Kind 
Dr. Kurzweil, would you please address the growing gap between the mind's intuitive linear ability and IT's geometric or uh, exponential growth, and specifically as regards the singularity, is the singularity a way to bridge that gap, or are we just going to forever be alienated? <laughs> well, the singularity is a metaphor borrowed from physics, and the metaphor is really not a point of infinity because exponentials, although they're explosive, don't actually become infinite. It's a metaphor with the event horizon around uh, a singularity. Even in physics, there actually is no point of infinity because quantum mechanics doesn't allow infinite values. Uh, <coughs> but there's a point, there's an event horizon around a black hole uh, because the forces are so great wi within a black hole that you can't easily see beyond the event horizon. And so uh, by my calculations, we computers will reach human levels of intelligence by 2029. Now you might say, aren't we there already? Because Jeopardy is a very broad natural language game and it, it's doing much better than humans. It actually doesn't do as good a job as you or I in reading a page. So it can read a page and say, ah, there's a 56% chance that Barack Obama's president, and you'd read the page, and if you didn't know that ahead of time, you'd conclude there's a 98% chance that Barack Obama's president. You did a better job than Watson reading that page. But Watson's made up for it by reading 200 million pages. It's read, you know, probably 200,000 on Barack Obama's presidency. It has a good Bayesian reasoning system. It can combine all those inferences to conclude that overall, there's a 99.99% chance that Barack Obama's president. And so it, it makes up for it by scale. That's what we hope to do at Google. We don't think we can read at human levels, but we can read at enough uh, accuracy to then do inference over the whole web and over all book pages. Uh, but by 2029, I think they will read at human levels and then go beyond that. Uh, you go out to, and then we will, as I said, merge with these technologies and we'll make ourselves, by my calculations, a billion times smarter by 2045. That's such a profound transformation that we borrow this metaphor from physics. Uh, but, you know, we're doing things today that were unimaginable. I'm co continually making predictions that people think are ridiculous because they look at uh, the current situation and we agree more or less on what the current sta status of things are. Uh, and the people apply, critics apply their linear intuition uh, and just think uh, these, uh, these projections are ridiculous. Uh, here is the progression we've made. Oops. This is the progress we've made uh, in longevity. We've quadrupled it in a thousand years. We've doubled it in 200 years. Uh, people actually forget what conditions are like. Um, <laughs> I, I told these junior high school students uh, that I was gave a lecture to recently that uh, they would all be senior citizens if it hadn't been for this progress. But this was before health and medicine was uh, an information technology. Now that it is an information technology, now that we have the enabling factors like the genome and enough understanding of how that software works, uh, that this will go into high gear uh, in the fairly near future. According to my models, 15 years from now, we'll be adding more than a year every year to your remaining life expectancy. Um, so, and I've been actually thinking, you know, some people actually accept uh, this very readily, uh, this exponential perspective, and some people are very resistant to it, including brilliant, accomplished people, uh, and I'm trying to wonder why that is. It does have a little bit to do with age. Uh, <laughs> these junior high school students are very receptive to this idea. They came up to me afterwards and said, yeah, things were so different when I was eight. Uh, so, <laughs> so they've seen enough change in the last three or four years since they started using computers. Anyway, thank you very much.